Well, good morning again. As Pastor Len said, I am Pastor Branding, having a great opportunity to share God's Word with you uh, this morning. And so um, we have been uh, in a small uh, series called One Book Wonders, or One Hit Wonders, I should say, um, on these, these one books. And we've been looking at Obadiah and Jude is what we looked at last week, and I get to wrap up with uh, Philemon this week. And so I'm, a, I'm excited to look at this short book, I think is, is probably uh, one of the most overlooked books in the New Testament, but I think uh, incredibly impactful uh, for how we consider uh, reconciliation, our relationships, about the basis of our relationships. So I'm excited to be able to open it this morning. We're going to um, read the book of Philemon, short 25 verses here. And then we're going to begin our time together taking a look at it. So if you have your Bible with you, or if you're uh, online, you're able to look it on the screen or find something at home for you to read. Philemon, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order Excuse me, that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he is parted from you for a while, that he might that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me even for your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let us spend a moment in prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you. Oh God, you are righteous and holy, creator of all things, sustainer. And Lord, you have revealed yourself fully and completely to us through your word. Lord, now as we look to your word, Father, I pray that your spirit would search the hearts of those within the sound of my voice. Father, the Spirit would convict us of righteousness and truth, convict us of sin, areas in which our lives need to better line up with the Scriptures. 
For Lord, you are God who does not change. We do not bend you to our will, but Lord, you bend us to yours. So Lord, may we be the clay in the potter's hands, seeking to be formed into the image of your Son. Lord, we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. When I was in college, I watched Nick at Night. Now, a couple of you, many of you know what that is. The other millennial in the room is laughing. Um, I watched Nick at Night, and so I loved older reruns. Nick, Nickelodeon had a Nick at Night, and when I was in college, I didn't sleep during those late night hours. And so I watched a show that was from the 50s and 60s, a drama known as Dragnet. Any, so a couple more Dragnet fans in the room. Okay. You may recall, Dragnet aired on television in the 50s and 60s, and there was Captain Joe Friday. Everybody remember Captain Joe Friday? And Sergeant Bill Gannon, and they were like the original crime drama. They tracked down criminals in methodical, deadpan precision, and they really were sticking to what? Just the facts. <laughs> of course, as every good crime drama, trauma, or every good crime drama, Justice always triumphed, and the lawbreakers were put behind bars. Now, since then, crime stories and crime dramas themselves have remained a, a popular television uh, genre. CSI, uh, NCIS, all these spinoffs. You see uh, Law and Order, so many of these. You know, now as well, we take rides in police cars, right? We see, see cops. And we see um, uh, body camera visions. We see America's Most Wanted. We see so many. And the goal is always to catch the thug, to punish the delinquent, and to make sure that they pay for what they've done. Well, back in 62 AD, a crime occurred in Colossae, an unimportant corner of the Roman Empire. And it probably would have remained completely unsolved, really unknown, and historically irrelevant, except that the fugitive fled to Rome and met not only Paul, but Christ. The slave I speak of is Onesimus. He's a runaway slave who really for what he had done now we don't exactly know what it is but many scholars believe uh, he possibly stole something or did something that he shouldn't have uh, and and left and fled from Colossae to Rome and he could have been executed tortured really harmful could have been punished massively now we don't know whether he sought out Paul for refuge or not because as, as we know from the New Testament, Philemon was a, a good brother in the Lord with Paul. Or maybe he met him in the providence of the Lord as he was a, really a wall in Rome. You see, Paul himself was under house arrest at the time in Rome. And the two men, we know, become really good friends. And they continued in their fellowship. They're growing in their brotherhood. And we recognize and understand that Onesimus becomes a believer in Christ, a brother in the Lord, as Paul puts it. And he begins to help Paul in his ministry. He becomes one of those, those men who, who come and, and minister, care for Paul, but then go and take care of some of the ministry that's outside of Paul's house arrest. Now, somewhere along the line, as Onesimus is realizing, I've come to Christ, and there needs to be reconciliation and confession of my sin, Onesimus must have confessed his background and his relationship to his former master, Philemon, and really his flight to freedom in Rome. And yet, despite Onesimus' newfound life in Christ, Paul knew, Paul knew that reconciliation, that resolution needed to be had so that his present life could be honorable before his Savior. Paul, therefore, takes it upon himself to write to Philemon, and that's where we get our letter. And this, this little book is a very personal letter. 
Although at the beginning it says, and to the church at your house, I, I can imagine that a large portion, really 13, 14 verses of this, was a very personal, private plea between Paul and Philemon. But really, this small personal letter is surrounded by a true story. A true story of crime, faith, confession, grace, and forgiveness. See, what we find in these 25 short verses is a, a people who are living out a picture of redemption as Onesimus, guilty of crime, sought reconciliation with Philemon. And it must be assumed that Philemon responded as Paul had hoped, extending forgiveness and perhaps freedom to him as a slave and brought him on back as a brother. At least we can assume that since the letter is actually included in, in the scriptures. I can't imagine that a failed one would, would actually be included. Like Onesimus, we stand guilty before the Lord, don't we? We stand guilty before God. And as is, has been the case for generation and generation and generation all the way back to Adam and Eve, typically we run away, don't we? We hide. We seek the shadows to be unknown. And we're seeking freedom really in all the wrong places. We're unable to contend with our past at times and to find true freedom in the present. Yet through Christ, we can find true release and slavery from sin and imprisonment to our past. You see, as we confess our inability to save ourselves and seek the forgiveness of God, we receive the joy of His amazing liberty of reconciliation. And that's what Paul is, is calling his brothers in the Lord here to this morning. And so let's, let's take a look at the letter itself as we begin to, to learn more about how Paul is writing to Philemon and what he's really getting at. Paul begins with a, a typical greeting, and he writes to Philemon. And he addresses, he addresses himself in a very interesting way. Typically, Paul addresses himself and says, I, Paul, what? An apostle of Christ. He states a, a very authoritative nature at the very front, but he, he takes a very different posture here, a, a great posture of humility, one that is both literal, literally and figuratively. Paul says, I am a prisoner for Christ. Now, he both literally was a prisoner because he was in Rome under house arrest because of teaching about Christianity and Christ crucified. But he was also figuratively a prisoner, a, a slave, if you will, a doulos, a slave to Christ, to do whatever he commanded as his Lord and Savior. But Paul goes on and he addresses a few people here in the midst of the book. And he addresses Philemon, but a couple other people in the midst of his house. Now, we know Philemon himself, and then Aphia, likely either uh, Philemon's wife or a dear sister in the Lord that worked uh, and, uh, along with the church there. Archippus, he lists as a fellow soldier. What a great military term you know, for a brother in Christ, uh, somebody who's laboring, working, fighting alongside with him. And he says also to the church in your house. Now he's talking to Philemon here. And we can learn a few things about Philemon just from that short little statement. In, in the Roman world, the known world at that time, especially in, in Colossae, Ephesus, and, and the like, it was rare for people to have a house. They typically had a room, maybe two at most, but rarely did they have a whole house. And so really, it begins to tell us a little bit about Philemon, that he, because he had his own house, and not only a house, but a house big enough to have the church, a, a gathering of believers at, it leads us to an understanding that Philemon was likely a man of considerable means in Colossae. A rich man who had become a, a believer and is now supporting the church, the local body of believers gathered there in his home in a tremendous way. Now, from what we know about a little bit of, of the book of Acts and the book of Colossae, Colossians, written to the church at Colossae, is that Philemon was uh, a dear brother in the Lord with Paul. Paul had met him on one of his journeys through the area and become uh, a convert at that time, and they had grown very close together. 
And Philemon had continued to support the work and ministry of the local body there long after Paul is gone. And so he says, listen, I'm writing to you, Philemon, and to the church in your house. And he sends greetings. I love the way he sends his greetings in verse 3. He says, grace to you and peace from God and Christ. Isn't that just a a perfect picture? It's a great addition problem. Number one, what's the first thing we receive? We receive grace, an unmerited favor from God. And in receiving that grace, what does that bring us? Peace. Grace given by God brings us peace in our relationship with Him. And that's given by both God the Father, our Heavenly Father who loves and adores us, but also our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul here is asserting something to be true about grace and peace and how those two things work together, but also about their source. They bring us, grace brings us peace with God and through Christ. What a great picture that is. All right, so Paul gives his greeting and then he begins to give a a thanksgiving, if you will, for Philemon and and his ministry. He gives this wonderful thanksgiving here. He says, man, listen, I thank God for you, Philemon. Every time I pray, I thank the Lord for the work that you're doing there because I hear of the great love and affection and faith you have in our Lord, but also for all the saints. He's he's giving him a, a tremendous encouragement that says, man, because of what you're doing, I am overjoyed and I praise God. I thank God for you. Why? Because the faith that I watched you come to, It is cultivated and now growing into something, a a great love and faith for Christ, but also for the saints there in Colossae. Paul is sending a a thanksgiving and an encouragement to him. And then verse 6, he goes into this prayer. So he tells finally, listen, I thank God for you every time I pray, and now here's how I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you continue to share your faith. Now, it's not likely that Philemon hadn't been doing that. We see that the church is relatively healthy at this point in his home. He's continuing to do that. But just this encouragement, Philemon, don't forget and encourage those in the church of your house, continue to share your faith and grow into every good work. The the verse 6 is a little confusing as we read it. He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. So the sharing of your faith may produce something may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Really to simplify it, Paul says, listen, when you share your faith, you live into and receive the fullness of all that God has given us. You see, because to not share your faith is to not live into the fullness of what God has created us to be and to do. And so Paul here is in his prayer to Philemon is saying, listen, I'm encouraging you to go and share your faith. And, and in doing so, you receive the greatest benefits of your faith to step into the fullness of what God has created you to do. He says you need to go and do that. And as you do that, here's what I get from it. I have derived much joy and comfort from you. I've derived much joy, not just some joy, not just a little encouragement. I've derived, Paul says, much joy, Philemon, from watching you put your faith on display in how you care for others and comfort. I've received comfort. I'm not worried about the church there. I'm not worried about what's going on there. Do you know why? Because I know that you've expressed genuine love and affection for my brothers and sisters there. I can express much joy and comfort because... The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The reason that Paul had much joy and comfort was because of the way in which Philemon had lived out his Christian beliefs in actions to others. That's Christian thought in actions, what we're seeing here. See, Philemon had learned the truth of the Scripture under Paul's teaching. He knew the the truth of the Scriptures and then is expressing them in love and care for his fellow brothers and sisters. So we we see two things, two really big themes that are coming throughout the whole letter, this Christian thought in action. It's not just enough to have Christian thought. 
I mean, even the demons believe that Jesus is real and He's the Son of God. But then to now take it and to put it into action. But we also see something about the nature of Christian fellowship. We see here, think about Philemon. Here's a, a rich man in a very metropolitan type city, and he could have lived without any outside people coming in. He could have lived in his own little space and, and lived and, and enjoyed it. You know, here in the suburbs, what do we do? We, we drive up to our home, we drive into our garage, we shut the door, and we live in our castle. Don't we? Philemon could have done that. In fact, he probably had a couple garages. But what Paul here is telling us, us about the nature of Christian fellowship is that it is sacrificial participation in the lives of others. Christian fellowship is sacrificial participation in the lives of others. Philemon is pouring himself out, opening his door, giving of his resources, caring for others, encouraging them, loving them, refreshing their souls, pouring himself out for the sake of the saints in Colossae. And Paul says, I praise God for you every time I pray because of that. Brothers and sisters, I think that begs the question, how rich is our fellowship truly? How much do, how often do we, how much do we actually consider sacrificially participating in the lives of others? Can I be honest with you? My life is a tornado with a hurricane in it and add a couple four-legged animals. Okay? I welcome you into my craziness anytime you want, but that's messy, isn't it? Our lives are messy. When we, when we enter into the lives of others, there's baggage. There's complicated relational aspects. There's so much involved in it. And yet here what we see is that that's the call of Christian fellowship. Now I'm the first to admit that in this season, this last year, it's been an incredibly difficult season of fellowship. You can amen at that. It's okay. <laughs> it is. I don't even know if you're laughing or frowning at me right now. There, I got a smile and a frown, okay? <laughs> Fellowship has been difficult. Sacrificing convictions and difficulties. How comfortable? Six and 12 feet or three? Or is it okay? Can I drop something off? Can I bake something for you? I don't really know. I feel awkward. I can't read your face. I don't know what's going on. Fellowship is so difficult right now. And we can admit to that. But it doesn't say that we still can't do it. <laughs> We just need to be more creative. More fences that pull down and turn into picnic tables. We've all seen that one, right? More creative ways for us to figure out, how do I give you a high five? I saw it on a secular TV show the other day. Six foot pole with a glove on the end. High five. <laughs> we need to come up with creative ways to continue because Christian fellowship is so important. In fact, it's so important that we sacrifice our own lives for participation in the lives of others. And that's even what Paul is, is, is demonstrating here. And I'll show you this as we move to our next section here. Paul then in verse 8 through 12, this, this lengthy area. And it's you got to think, we're, we have 25 verses in this whole book, and Paul spends um, 14 of them here in this plea. And this is the majority of the verses here. And he says, listen, I'm going to appeal for reconciliation. Paul is, is taking his relational credibility with Philemon and he's putting it out on the limb. And he said, I'm going to go out on a limb for the sake of my relationship with you, Philemon, but also the sake of my relationship with Onesimus. Now, Paul here begins, and I, I think so interestingly, in 8 and 9, he says, listen, I could appeal to you with a tremendous authority that I have as an apostle I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. But I'm not going to do that. Notice that kind of links with how he starts the letter. A prisoner for Christ. The humility of Paul there. He's not taking a position of authority here with Philemon. As the one who brought him to faith and started the church in Colossae, he says, no, I'm going to appeal to you for love's sake. Because I have great love and affection for you, Philemon. I have great love and affection for Onesimus as well. 
I'm going to appeal to you for love's sake because I care about you. I have great relationship with you. I'm not, not lording our relationship and my authority as an apostle over you because we are brothers in Christ. I appeal to you as an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ. This is what he says in verse 10. Here's his appeal. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Very important things here. Onesimus, the slave who defected or went AWOL from Philemon, is now, look how Paul describes him, a child in the faith, okay, of which Paul is the father of. So we see that Onesimus has come to faith in Christ under Paul in Rome. And so Paul is saying, listen, I appeal to you as as a father to this child in the faith. I'm appealing to you. Although, verse 11, formerly he was useless to you. He was useless. Maybe maybe Onesimus, and we don't fully know whether he stole something or whether he was a a poor servant or, or bond servant or not. But Paul says, listen, formerly he was useless to you. Whether he either didn't do his work there or he had gone and now he's gone and you know he's of no use to you. Listen, formerly he was useless. Let's just be honest. Let's call a spade a spade, okay? Formerly he was useless, but now he is indeed not only useful to you, but also to me, Paul says. Paul demonstrates the importance and the, the usefulness of, of this dear brother in the Lord now. And he says, listen, verse 12, I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending him back to you. In fact, I'm sending my very heart. That's a, that's a really huge statement there. Paul is saying, I have loved this dear brother so much. He's just like my very own part of my heart. And why is he sending him back to him? Well, uh, Colossians 4.9 um, helps clarify this. 4.7, uh, uh, 8, 9, 10 kind of helps clarify. And here's, here's simply what it is. Here's what we know. That Paul was sending the letters of, of Ephesians and Colossians uh, with these messengers. And Onesimus was one of them. And there was a, about three or four other ones that, that Paul was sending these letters with. So they were all going to go back and they were going to deliver the letter of, of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus and the book of Colossians to the book at Colossae. And because they're going to Colossae, they were delivering the letter of Philemon to Philemon there. And so he says, listen, I'm sending him back to you. He says, listen, I, I would have kept him. Trust me, I would have loved, I would love to keep Onesimus. He's been a dear brother in the Lord and a, and a huge encouragement to me. He has been uh, just so, such a tremendous brother and encouragement. In fact, I, I would love to keep him in order that he might serve me on your behalf. But brother, listen, I didn't want to coerce you into that. I didn't want to presume upon your goodness. I didn't want to make you do something that under compulsion... I want you to willingly do it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send him back to you. Do what you will. Whether he comes back to me or goes to you, may God be glorified. But keeping him would have been forcing you to do something. No, I'll send him back to you. But listen, 15, maybe this is why he was parted for you for a while, that you might receive him back. So in 15, you know, Paul kind of shifts and he, and he goes from making this appeal and, hey, I'm sending him back to you, then, then say, listen, here's God's providence in this whole situation. Maybe, maybe the Lord is doing something here. Maybe he parted from you for a while so that you might have him back. And look at this. This is so important. If you, if you have your Bible with you, or look at it. For, perhaps this is why he parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. In 16, no longer. Look at these words. No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother. Paul is basing his entire plea. The, the basis for reconciliation here is not you should forgive him because he's forgivable. You should forgive him because you loved him. You should accept him back because of his good, good works. It is not anything of those. It is the only reason, the whole reason for Paul's appeal of bringing back, Philemon should bring back Onesimus is because of Christ. Period. Take back Onesimus, not as your slave, but as your brother in Christ. 
And we see something beautiful here, a truth that, that we know, but here we're seeing it fleshed out. The gospel changes everything. The gospel changes everything. It changes the nature of relationships. It changes how we relate to one another. It changes our identity. For Onesimus was once a slave, and not just a slave, a disobedient, AWOL, possibly thief, or a poor worker of a slave. And Paul says he's now brother. That's transformation. The gospel transformed. And Paul says that's the nature in which you should receive him now as. Because the gospel has transformed his life. Not because of your great love. Not because of anything else. What a tremendous statement. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. In in the confines of the, of the first century, slavery, you know, now the slave has, has taken something from me, or at least he's defected. Now you, wait, hold on a minute. You want me to not just take him back? It's, it's one thing. Paul's not just saying take him back. He's saying accept him as part of your family. This is absolutely crazy in the first century thought. You want me to do what? Paul says take him back as a beloved brother. Listen, he has been such a great blessing to me, but how much more to you can he be? Both in his flesh, right? Because when, when, we, when we come in contact with the gospel, when we, when we understand the truths of Christ, it, our brains begin to be rewired and transformed. As, as Romans 12 tells us, that we're renewing our mind Okay, in the ways of the Scripture daily, and it transforms who we are. I don't think like I thought 20 years ago. Praise be to God. We don't think like that anymore, do we? And so Onesimus now, coming back to this, he's thinking differently. I can work better. I can work more diligently. I can be a, a better Christ-honoring brother in the Lord. It changes the way we think and see things. It changes our actions, or at least it should Christian thought and how that changes our actions. Well, Paul says, listen. In fact, I love this. In, in the next section, 17 through 21, is the only place that Paul gives imperatives. It gives the, you have to do this. Up until this point, he hasn't said you have to do anything. He's given him a, a voluntary appeal. My brother, please, would you consider? But then he, he says, no, here, I'm going to give you a couple imperative, some things that you have to do. And he uses three very important words here just for you to highlight. So if, you, if you're one of those people who writes in your Bible or highlights or makes a note of it, here are those three important words. Number one, receive him. Verse 17, receive. You need to do this. You need to receive him. Now, how should you receive him? This is very important. He says, listen, if, he uses an if then, okay? If you consider me a partner, also great word for Christian fellowship, a partner in the gospel, a partner in our faith, a partner for the sake of Christ. This is Christian fellowship. He says, Philemon, if you have fellowship with me, then receive Onesimus just as you would me. Paul here is demonstrating something he understands about the body of Christ being one. Receive Onesimus just as you would me, as if I'm sending a part of my own body to you. Receive him just as you would receive me. All right? Second imperative is in 18. Charge. Charge. Again, he says he uses an if-then statement here in 18. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. What? If Onesimus owes you anything or, or has done you any wrong thing, charge it to my account. I'll pay. I will repay. And then, and then he uh, 19 is kind of the, this is like a, a, a first century version of here's my signature. I promise to do so. You know that little line on the bottom of your form with your kids that says, I'm responsible for repaying all of the healthcare benefits and all of the co-pays and everything else that needs to be done. And you go, yeah, sure, no problem. You sign that at the bottom. Because of course you would do that for your children. That's what Paul's doing here in 19. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. No, nobody's, nobody's scribing it for me. Nobody's making it up. No, I write this with my own. I will repay it. 
Paul teaches us something about the sacrificial nature of Christian fellowship here. And more importantly, brothers and sisters, he teaches us how his theology of Christ from Philippians 2, Christ considering others as better than himself, fleshes itself out in our relationships. We'll get there, though. We'll get there. So that's the, the second imperative. Listen, charge it to my account. Third, and the final one that he gives here is in verse 20. He says, refresh my heart in Christ. Refresh my heart in Christ. Listen, that we should, we should hear that and go, wait a minute. Didn't we just see that? We see that in verse 7 where Paul says, listen, Philemon, I'm so grateful for you because you have refreshed the souls. You've refreshed the saints there in Colossae. Here, brother, in, I want something from you. He says in 20, I want to benefit from you, brother. In taking back Onesimus, it would refresh my soul. It would refresh my heart in Christ to see that the truth of the gospel, the imperatives of how we relate to one another because of being both one in Christ lives itself out in our actions that would refresh my heart and soul. Please do so. What a beautiful picture. And then Paul says something that, to be honest with you, even as I've spent all week studying it, still blows my mind. I am confident of your obedience. At first, when I read it, it sounded a little bit like when you write an email and you're like, I'm grateful for your compliance in advance. Right? Like, thank you in advance for listening to my gripe. But that's not how Paul writes it. Paul doesn't write it as this passive aggressive, like, I know you're going to listen to me because I just made an appeal for you. You better do it. No, he, he writes it as a, as a dear brother who has great affection and respect for Philemon. And he says, listen, I'm confident of your obedience. Not because I know you're going to listen to me because I have authority, but because I know your heart. I know the love and affection you have for the saints. I know that you understand, Philemon, the truths of the Scriptures and desire to live out your Christian thought in action and to demonstrate what Christian fellowship really looks like. I know you're going to do it. And by the way, I know you're going to do even more than I say. I know it. Paul here is expressing not a passive-aggressive, I know you're going to listen to me. He's expressing a, I have full faith that you'll do it and you'll do more because you love me and more importantly, you love Christ. I have full faith in that. And so it's a joyful statement, a wonderful statement that teaches about this appeal for reconciliation, that teaches us about Christian thought and how it lives itself out in action and how Christian fellowship interacts here. Well, Paul closes his letter uh, with a few small little points, nothing terribly to dwell on, but in 22, uh, you know, we see something a little historical here. Paul says, listen, at the same time that you're considering my appeal and hopefully you're taking Onesimus back, will you prepare a room for me? <laughs> I want to come visit you. I want to come hang out. I want to come be with you. I'm hoping through your prayers, that I will be graciously given to you. Now, we don't know if Paul ever made it to Colossae again. We don't know if he made it to Philemon's house, but Paul is saying, listen, listen, brother, I want us to come spend time with you. I've just expressed all this love and a great affection and appreciation for the way you live this out. I want to come spend some time with you. I hear you have a big house. Come hang. And he says, listen, um, some other folks, they send some greetings. Here's a fellow prisoner, Epaphras. Here's some other of my fellow workers. You know, here we see Luke, the writer of Luke Acts. We see Mark. Don't know if that's John Mark of, of the Gospel of Mark. Likely uh, it might be. But he ends with this, that the grace of the Lord Christ be with your spirit. He begins with grace. He ends with grace. An unmerited favor from the Lord. And not maybe, maybe with you all, Maybe with you, but he says, maybe with your spirit. The, the spirit here, not being the Holy Spirit, but be the inner being of all of who you are. May it rest in the grace of our Lord Christ Jesus. What a great way to end a letter, especially a, a passionate appeal. You know, I think there are three major things that we need to consider here in Philemon, and I've touched on them, but I just want to briefly 
talk about some of the really the applications of these in the midst of our life. Now, Paul here clearly is um, handling something and teaching us something about the way in which he handled slavery in the first century. Bond servant, doulas is the word for slavery. Now, slavery, as we've talked about some time ago, and I'm happy to have these conversations again, looked very different, looked totally different at that time. So the, we have to understand that the church lived in its own context, first of all. Now, I would say that at that time, in the first century, slavery was really widely accepted. People put themselves in it in order to pay debt. They put themselves in it to have a good job. They, they worked their way through. I mean, Joseph uh, from Exodus was one of the greatest bond servants, and God used him as a deliverer for his people. But while slavery was generally accepted in the first century, many voices spoke out against it at that time as well. And at that time, historically, a lot of those things incited riots in the Roman government. People died. It incited violence. And here's what Paul knew and understood. Paul knew that the church could not and should not be the one taking up the sword against things. That the church had been given what is called the keys, not the sword. The civil government has been given the sword to enact and, and uphold the laws. Now, Paul knew that the church could not be perceived as the ones who are instigating those rebellions. Because he knew, number one, it would be leading to a loss of life, and two, it would lead to greater persecution on the Christian church. You see, the Roman Empire had with it the mechanism for effecting change, and, and that mechanism um, was that change had to come voluntarily from the individuals whose lives were changed in that society by Christ. The change had to come from within the empire. Now, that's a food for thought as you think about how many years Paul spent in Roman prison and as he's enacting and, and spreading the gospel there in Rome. He knew how and what he was doing. You see, Paul recognized that slaves could be freed by anyone who owned them. And even if their freedom at times caused greater problems than it solved. No, what we understand here is that Paul was taking a theological route to slavery to ending it, to abolishing it, to understanding when people understood that they had freedom in Christ, that that would be the greatest freedom that led to an understanding that this other thing, this earthly slavery, is wrong. And so Paul, as the theological, as the, the theologian here, he sowed theological seeds. And as he sowed them, he understood that if solid theological foundation existed, and as it was rooted and founded, that a permanent change would come slowly, but it would come slowly and it would begin to erode this institution. The second application and thing we need to understand about Philemon itself is this idea of, of Christian fellowship. I talked about it a few times, but what we see is that, that Christian fellowship, it, it makes God and the gospel primary over individual ideas and ambitions. Christian fellowship makes God and the gospel primary over individual ideas and ambitions. As I said earlier, fellowship is participation in the lives of one another. As Paul says in verse 17, if you consider me a partner, right? If you consider me in fellowship, you see partners remain committed to the deepest levels. And that is where Paul made his appeal to Philemon first as a partner of fellowship of Christ. As I said, Paul had brought Philemon to Christ, and he had built deep relationship with him. And Paul had built deep abiding brotherhood and fellowship with Onesimus. And now Paul then had to step out. He had to participate in the lives of others. He had to sacrificially do so. Paul realized that Christian fellowship involves active participation in each other's lives. He also realizes that the circumstances that made people the way they are and the transforming power of the gospel can change them. See, on the other hand, he shows us as well what it is to become involved in the lives of others to help encourage them to both seek and to honor Christ in their relationship. And so Philemon teaches practically what it means to be in Christ. 
individualistic ideas and ambitions become secondary. And participation in the larger work of God becomes primary. Think of, take up your cross and follow me. One must lose himself to find himself. You see, Christians must forgive. They must hope for the best. They must treat others as Christ has treated them and as they hope to be treated. Paul promised Philemon that if he did what he should, if, sorry, Paul promised Philemon that if he did what he should, he would have Onesimus as a brother in the flesh and in the Lord. And both relationships matter, folks. Both relationships matter. But there's only one of those two that lasts forever. I don't need to tell you that our earthly flesh is fading. Mine's starting to fail, and I'm not that old. But the spiritual relationship, it lasts forever. The call to Christ is to join us in fellowship with other Christians, and fellowship appreciates all others who are in Christ, regardless of socioeconomic, skin color, uh, background, culture, history, continent. Okay, Whether you're not a Seahawks fan, it doesn't matter. We appreciate one another in Christ. Uh, the last thing, really last application, is this idea of Christian thought in action. See, following Christ is not just believing the right thing, but putting those beliefs into action. Okay? Putting those things into action. And that's what Paul is, is both exemplifying in Philemon and calling him to at the same time. See, expressions of, of Christian thinking, they permeate this letter. I think first we see that two people here were in need of reconciliation, and Paul sought a way to accomplish it, just as Christ did. I love this. Paul really emulates Christ. The letter doesn't serve to illustrate that, but Paul in his conviction, beliefs, and understanding of who Jesus is seeks to live that out here in his plea for Onesimus. Like I said, first, he... He sought a way to accomplish reconciliation, just as Jesus did. Paul here pleaded the case of Onesimus. He takes the side of the guilty in calling for forgiveness. Similarly, Jesus pleaded the case for you, a sinner, bringing us to the Father. Okay. Third, Paul offered to pay the debt that Onesimus owed, even though it was not Paul's responsibility. Brothers and sisters, Jesus took the debt that we owed a crushing debt that we could never repay. And he not only paid it, he paid it victoriously and completely in full. Fourth, we see the reconciliation was in essence, it was affected in Paul. He was the tie that, that brought Philemon and, and Onesimus together. And so through Paul, harmony was restored. Just as Christ in relationship with us brings us back into relationship with God through what He has accomplished on the cross. Death, burial, resurrection, conquering victoriously. Paul's consistent theme here in Christ reveals that he thought the same way regarding God's human relationship. God and human relationship. Our relationship with God. That in Christ, humanity and deity are reconciled. And so Paul acted like Christ did, just as Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5 through 13. And so the epistle really provides insight into Paul that no other epistle does. Here we not only see, we don't see Paul's high, lofty theological ideas about who Christ is and, and how you should believe them and how sanctification and justification work together. He says, no, this letter shows us how faith and belief turns into action. See, we don't see Paul's, we don't hear Paul's theology in the words, we see Paul's theology in his actions. See, Paul here ponders the meaning of grace, the cross, the nature of salvation. And what he saw was that apart from personal salvation, nothing equals Christ-likeness in attitudes or actions. In fact, 
The gospel demands that that's how we respond in Christ likeness. Forgive to the measure that you've been forgiven. See, in this epistle to Philemon, Paul didn't just illustrate it. He demonstrated it to us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this short but powerful packed book that reminds us and shows us, Lord, what it is to live out our belief in Christ. Lord, the beauty of how reconciliation demonstrates itself in the life of those who call themselves Christians. Father, I don't know what's going on in the midst of everybody's heart and minds and lives today, but you do. Lord, and you know that today there, there are some Philemons in the room. Some Philemons that have been wronged by others and are holding grudges or angry or upset because of what's been done to them. Lord, I pray that through the lens of your gospel, and the work of Christ on the cross, Lord, that they could see forgiveness. How many times to forgive your brother? Seven? Seven times seven? Forever. Christ calls us to forgiveness. Lord, but there's also some in this room today that are Onesimus. Some who are in need of reconciling and, and making things right. Some who have, who have faltered and fallen, who have harmed others who have hurt one another. Lord, I pray that, that you would stir in their hearts to, to go and be reconciled. If our brother sins against us, Lord, that, that we would go back to them. If we recognize that there's something between us, that before we would leave our, 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 our offering at the altar and go and be reconciled. Lord, that takes great humility, proper understanding of the gospel. And yet, Lord, there's also some in here that are like Paul today some who have a relationship with brothers and sisters who are not getting along, Lord, and that they would plead with one another, that they would be the connecting thing that, that demonstrates and shows what it is to, to walk in the ways of Christ, to demonstrate and care for, to, to, to bring one another together and recognize that it is because of Christ and our unity in the body that unites us together, that we can lay down our wrongs because Christ has paid for them. We no longer hold one another accountable, but Christ has paid the price. Father, I pray that we as a body would continue to strive to live out our faith, that our Christ-honoring thoughts would lead us to action that demonstrate what it is that we believe to be true and right about who God is and how we should live. Lord, we pray and ask these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.